Um, let's all open up our Bibles. Still moving? Still moving? Let's all open up our Bibles to the book of Amos. Minor prophet. To the book of Amos. It's really low? Good eye, Luke. Let me see here. I wonder why. Wonder, it is low, huh? How about now? That's a little, that's better. Even better? That's a little too loud. All right. Is that better, Luke? You see that with, with your eagle eye there? All righty. All right, the book of Amos. Where's the book of Amos at? There we go. Amos chapter Amos chapter 4. Amos chapter 4. Jordan, can you hear me all right on the phone over here? Yep, you're all good. I just had to turn off my mic. My siblings are being loud. Right, okay. All righty, Amos chapter 4. Amos chapter 4, verse number 13. For lo... He that formeth the mountains, and createth the wind, and declareth unto man, what is his thought? God declares, you know, God declares to us, what is our thought? The Bible knows all about man, and it, and it tells it like it is. It knows about us. God knows about us. Declareth unto man, what is his thought? That maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high places of the earth. The Lord... The God of hosts is his name. Not that that was a fascinating verse. Now, what I want to zone in for tonight, for lo, he that formeth the mountains. He that formeth the mountains. So what we're going to talk about tonight is we're going to do a Bible study on mountains, and more particularly mountains in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to speak about mountains tonight, and this will be under the playlist of our, uh, I don't know what the title, maybe Lessons from God's Nature. Remember we spoke about snow one time and however, you know, in, in, in the characteristics of snow and how they, you know, you could see things of God just from studying snow. So I got off on one of those kicks again and just looking at mountains and I'm going to say, okay, Lord, what, what could you show me about mountains uh, in the Bible? And um, so we're here, here's the next piece of nature we're going to be studying is mountains. Now, obviously some of the most magnificent creations of God, I believe, are, are mountains. Uh, the tallest mountain on earth is Mount Everest, okay, 29,000 feet tall, 29,000 feet tall, and I looked up a list of the tallest mountains and stuff on Wikipedia, and they bring, brought me this big, huge list. There's over lists, there's hundreds of mountains that are over 10,000 of feet tall. That's tall. <laughs> That's real tall. And, uh, you know, there's nothing more beautiful than mountain to me personally. If I had to pick one screensaver on my computer, okay, besides my lovely wife, I got you, baby, don't worry. Besides my wife, if I had to pick one screensaver on my computer, it would, be, it would be a picture of a mountain. I just like mountains. And it's interesting, one of the paintings that we did together a couple months ago, uh, first painting I did since high school, I didn't know what I was doing, but somehow managed to, to formulate a, a decent painting of a mountain with, with, with snow on the peak and the hills and the pine trees and the cherry blossom tree with the pink flowers and stuff. It was, it's actually cool. I'm proud of it. I got that thing hanging right above my desk. <laughs> but there's something about mountains uh, in the Bible. Mountain, they're fascinating. And uh, next thing I looked up is, okay, well, God, he made a 29,000 foot mountain. And I looked up, right, let's see what man could make, okay? The tallest structure is a building in Dubai, that city's wild as it is. That city looks like it's in the it's in the future or something. I had to really look it up. Like, is this from a movie? <laughs> okay, but a thing from Dubai. They got a, a, this building called Khalifa. It's two thousand and seven two thousand seven hundred and seventeen feet tall, which is tall. I mean, that's pretty amazing. That's a tall two thousand seven hundred feet tall. This building. But then I think about God. God made a rock. He made he form. It said the Bible says he formeth the mountains. He pulled that thing up 29,000 feet, Mount Everest. That's amazing. All right. And, uh, you know, it's like, okay, you know, you're, you man, you could build your tall buildings and tall structures, but you ain't going to get close to building something that's 29,000 feet tall. Um, now, another thing, you know, you, you look at mountains in the Bible, and no doubt they have a significant role throughout the whole entire Bible. 
You just run through the very first mountain. I'll give you a list of references on mountains in the Bible. The very first mountain is the ark rested upon Mount Arat. Okay, Mount Arat be present day Turkey. Mount Arat, Genesis 8, verse 4. Noah's ark. Now I want you to take note about all how all these 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 things that we're going to go through. These are big events in the Bible. And and they take place, they don't take place on some sandy beach or whatever, like they take place on a mountaintop. There's something there's something glorious about a mountain. Mount Arad, Genesis 8, chapter 8, verse 4. Next mountain we'll be familiar with is Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 19. What happened on Mount Sinai? God spoke to Moses, okay, directly spoke to Moses and gave him the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Next thing you know, Deuteronomy 32, this is the next mountain is Mount Nebo. Deuteronomy 32, verse 49. And this is the mountain which, you know, after Moses, he couldn't get into the promised land. Because he, he didn't listen to every word of God. He smote the rock. God said, you talk to the rock. And, and Moses smote the rock. He hit it twice. You can see a bunch of pictures and typologies there, which that rock was Christ. And Jesus Christ was only smitten for our sins one time. You don't have to continue to kill him. Moses sm smote that rock twice. That kept him from the promised land. So God said, okay, go up to Mount Nebo. Overlook all this plains right here. I'm going to give you all this land, yet you're not going to go into it. And next thing you know, Moses dies on Mount Nebo. You know, God says, look, you come up on this mountain. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you up there, and that's it. And Moses dies. Up on, and get, but the blessing is God buries Moses. That's always interesting. You know, say, where's Moses' shrine? Where's his tomb at? If the Jews knew where, knew where Moses' tomb was at, they would be worshiping at his tomb. But God buried Moses somewhere up on that mountain, on Mount Nebo. Deuteronomy 32, 49. Next one is Mount Carmel. Another big significant event happened in the book of 1 Kings chapter 18. This is what Elijah, the prophet Elijah, and it's, it's the big standoff between whose God is real. All right, you know, a lot, you're familiar with the story. Elijah goes up, and then the Baalite worshipers, the people that are worshiping Baal, they go, they go up to this, this Mount, uh, Mount Carmel, and Elijah says, look, if, if, if your God's true, then build this little altar, and put this, you know, and, and, and put a sacrifice, and God's going to accept the sacrifice and cause fire. And they were crying on Baal all night long, and, and oh, Baal, hear us. And, and, you know, Elijah mocked their God and stuff and said that your God's sleeping or he's on a far journey or something, so it's okay to take a hit at Allah and Buddha, and it's okay to knock other people's things, okay, over here and there. Um, you got to use some wisdom with that, obviously, when you're witnessing to those people, but speaking about believing crowd, <laughs> don't take offense to when people knock other gods. But anyways, the, the showdown on Mount Carmel and Elijah's sacrifice, he, he puts water around it to make sure there's no, you know, no funny play going on or nothing like that, like he's lighting no fuses or whatever, and God strikes down that, uh, that sacrifice and accepts it. Okay, that's at Mount Carmel. Another one's the Mount of Olives. Uh, David uses it as a refuge when his son Absalom rebelled to him. Mount of Olives. And this is also where Jesus Christ preached one of his most famous sermons on, on Mount of Olives. So, uh, and we're going to look at a couple more here once we get further into the study, but no doubt God uses mountains to show His strength. He uses mountains to show His steadfastness. He uses mountains to show judgment. He uses mountains to show victory. And also He uses the mountains to show His glory. So God got a particular thing about that piece of creation. And I love this. I gotta, I, I'm going to do a couple more of these messages because it's really a, a blessing to study these. Like, you just look around nature and how God uses certain things like trees and, and, um, and seeds and all, all kinds of stuff that, that there's lessons behind these things or, or behind creation. So I wanna, uh, I'm going to focus on two mountains in the life of Jesus Christ okay, that really focused on what was Jesus Christ, His mission, and what was His identity about the mission of the, the Lord Jesus Christ, and not only his mission, what he was coming to do, but who was he? So these, there's two mountains in his life that give you the, his identity and his mission, okay? Um, so first off, let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 17. Look at Matthew chapter 17, verse... Uh, I always like this passage. Matthew 17, verse number 2. Matthew 17, verse number 2. Now I'm going to look at some... Uh, I guess these would be these some, some contrasts of these two mountains in the life of the Lord. Look at Matthew chapter 17. 
let's look at start at, start at verse number one. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. Now, that, that's actually pretty cool because there, there's some things that you know. If you know about the thousand the thousand year formula, and we know what that says, it means what it says. It says what it means flat out. Okay, he literally took them up to a mountain, but there's always uh, another element of interpretation of Scripture, which is after six days, a day with the Lord is a thousand years. We know God's working on a 7,000-year calendar. It's almost like after six days, when he gets down here, he takes Peter, James, and John up to another mountain. He took them up to a mountain over here. He's going to take them up to another mountain over here, which we're going to see further into the study. But there's a little cool little nugget there. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, as the sun. You can write down, if you want to cross-reference, Malachi chapter 4 in Revelation chapter 1, where Jesus Christ is likened unto the sun of righteousness, S-U-N. So there's typology there with the sun as a, as a picture of Jesus Christ. But his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light at the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, uh, now, it's interesting that many, most people would say that this would, this would be called Mount Hermon. Now, we're not too sure. We don't, the Bible doesn't specifically say what mountain this is, but uh, I'll read this. Um, Mount Hermon was suggested by R.H. Fuller and J. Lightfoot for two reasons. It is the highest site in the area given that the transfiguration took place on a high mountain and is located near Caesarea Philippi, where the previous events reportedly took place. And then he then says something interesting, which you could take it or leave it, but the fallen angels told of in the book of Enoch landed on this mountain for the purpose of polluting God's creation through the creation of giants, mighty men of old, men of renown. Now, I don't know about the book of Enoch. They're, you know, that's obviously not scripture. People say, well, that's scripture, but don't ever say Enoch wrote nothing. It said Enoch prophesied. He spoke something. But it would be weird. You know, you think about where them sons of God, what mountain did they touch down upon? And I don't know, could it be that the same mountain wickedness happened, that the same mountain Jesus Christ was transfigured before everybody? His, his, uh, his face shone bright as the sun. Now, this is a picture of Christ in glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's a picture of his who he is, his identity, but it's a picture of his second advent, okay? Now I want to talk about another mountain, come to the book of Isaiah. Now we see on the Mount of Transfiguration, his face shone as bright as the sun. Now look at Isaiah chapter 52. Well, yeah, Isaiah chapter 52. Right before the, right before the prophetic chapter, we should know about Isaiah 53, okay? Look at Isaiah chapter 52. Verse number 13 and 14. Now what other mountain is, is, is big in the, in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ? Mount Calvary. Okay. Now look at verse 13, Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be, and be very high. As many as were uh, a stone-eyed at thee. A stone-eyed, like a stone, like fixed, like, almost like it would be our astonished. Many were a stone-eyed at thee. His visage was so marred more than any man. His visage, his visual, his face, his body, okay, was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. You could almost, he was beaten to a pulp to where you could barely recognize who that man was on the cross. Now on one mountain, Jesus Christ's face shined like light. His raiment was bright as light. Next thing you know, on Mount Calvary, he was beaten to a pulp. He couldn't even tell who, to, who he was. His visage was so marred. You see the contrast already on the two, on his identities and his mission. Uh, identity, he was a deity. He was God manifest in the flesh. Next thing you know, on Mount Calvary, showed his, showed his shame, showed, uh, showed his mission, though. Okay? You know, I like that, I like that verse in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse number 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by Him. 
in the world knew him not. He was in the world. The world was made by him, and they still didn't know who he was, he, that he was God. I always like that old saying is, you know, um, what was it? He died, he died upon, a, he was nailed to a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. He, he, he was the one that formed, like that verse says in Amos, he formeth the mountains. And I don't know, I picture God just picking up pieces and just stretching that thing out, and there's a, there's a big mountain. He formed the hill on which it stood, yet they killed him on, on that, okay? You know, we always sing that song, on a hill far away stood the old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. So there's some shame there on that mountain, yet you know, on the Mount Transfiguration shows his glory, okay? Uh, another interesting thing, I don't know if you've got to turn there, but write down Psalms chapter 2, verse 6. Ezekiel 20, verse 40, in Revelation. I'm getting this through my reading of Psalms. If you, you know that the word hill and mountain in the Bible is used synonymously. Okay, hill, is, uh, Jesus Christ says, or, or the Lord in the Bible says one time, on my holy hill, Mount Zion. Then he calls it a holy mountain. So there's a debate. <laughs> you know, well, I remember we're driving to North Carolina and we're... We're saying that's a that's a mountain right there, and he's like, I think that's a hill. You know, it's a we're, it's it's both, <laughs> it's a hill and it's a mountain. So that's just how the and I and I think of that because in the book of Revelation chapter seventeen, where it says the horse sits on seven mountains, okay, and you just type a, you know, the city that sits on seven mountains. Well, nothing comes up, but you type in the city that sits on seven hills, and then bang, and then Rome shows up. <laughs> so mountain and hill could be used synonymously. Uh, just to just to further back the proof of Rome is mystery Babylon too, but just to know that thing. Now come back to uh, let's look at another account. Look at Mark. Look at Mark chapter nine. Look at Mark chapter nine. Okay, this is the other account of the Mount Transfiguration. All right, Mark chapter nine. We could just stick in Matthew, but just might as well get some get some flipping and turning going. Let's look at the scriptures. Look at Mark chapter nine. Look at verse number, uh, verse number three. And his raiment, okay, his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. I mean, that's as white as it gets. Absolutely white as can be. There ain't no, nothing even whiter than what he looked like on this mountain, Mount Transfiguration. Yet come to Matthew chapter 27, What do you think his clothing looked like when he was getting beaten? You know, obviously they were red as they were red. They were covered in blood. They were stained. Okay, and then Matthew chapter twenty-seven, verse number, verse number twenty-eight, um, twenty-seven. I'm at twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. So one of, okay, this is leading up to Mount Calvary, okay? But it's interesting. On one mountain, he was white as snow in his glory. Then on the next way leading up to the next mountain, they were mocking him. They put on a scarlet color robe on him. And obviously, when you see, know the bloodshed of what, of what happened on Calvary, you can only imagine that, that his whatever garment, if he was wearing a garment on the cross, um, was bloody as can be on that mountain. Now, those are just some, some contrasts of... His glory and his shame. Okay, uh, the next one. I'm gonna go go back to Matthew chapter 17 again. Matthew chapter 17, verse number three. And behold, there appeared unto him unto them Moses and Elias, talking with them. Now Elias, that's Elijah. Okay, the old that's Old Testament prophet. And most of the time when Jesus Christ was categorizing the canon of Scripture. He would always call the law and the prophets. Now, the law would be the books of Moses, and the prophets would be Elijah. And it's a little side note thing, but the last two people that show up in the book of Malachi in the Old Testament before the coming of the Lord is Moses and Elijah and the Lord. There's a last chapter in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4. You see them, four, them three characters, Moses, Elijah, and the Lord. That's why I believe one of the things that the two witnesses in the tribulation period will be Moses and Elijah. I mean, there's no greater people that's going to convert Judaism, that's going to convert the Jews, than Moses and Elijah. That symbolizes the law and the prophets, right there. There was two people uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, okay, 
Yeah, the, the, which categorized the law and the prophets. Okay, then, then we know on uh, we're in the book of Matthew, come to Matthew chapter 27, Matthew 27, 38. That's at Mount, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah show up. Now look at Matthew chapter 27. Look at verse number 38. Look at verse 37. And upon his head was the accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. This is Mount Calvary, and look who's next to him. Then were there two thieves crucified. <laughs> two, two of the biggest people in all the Bible, Moses and Elijah, show up on the, on the Mount Transfiguration in his glory. Next thing you know, on the, on, his, on the day of the shame, the crucifixion, next thing you know, he's crucified next to two thieves. Okay? So another interesting um, uh, contrast on these two mountains in the life of the Lord. Now, Luke, uh, a thing in Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verse 32, there's a particular thing. That's why I kind of like going to all the different accounts, because you'll get, you'll get different things, you know, certain details in, in, in the other, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? Now Luke, look at Luke nine twenty, uh, Luke Luke nine thirty two. Okay. But Peter, and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory. Now notice that, and the two men that stood with him, they saw his glory. Okay. Now on one mountain, he was glorified. Yet on the other mountain, he was forsaken, and he was in the dark. Now that's something. Let's look at let's look at Matthew chapter. I mean, you don't have to turn there, but Matthew chapter twenty-seven, verse forty-six. In Matthew twenty-seven. I'll read them. Matthew twenty-seven, forty-six through fifty. Um, yeah, wait, twenty, twenty-seven. I always get twenty-six and twenty-seven confused. Twenty-seven, verse forty. Yeah, 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land under the ninth hour. In the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Okay? So one mountain, okay, Jesus Christ, they saw his glory. Next mountain, and he was light, it was light, sh shined about, bright as, you know, bright as snow. Next mountain, it was darkness. And next mountain, there was no glory. He was forsaken, okay? Um, now, if, if you're still in Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17, verse number 5. Now, look at the next thing. Well, I'll come down, we'll read verse number 4. Then, then answered Peter and said Jesus unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. You know, of course, you know, the, Peter liked being on the mountaintop with the Lord and His glory, okay? But uh, like the old thing would be, you know, it's good when the Lord's all, all, you see the Lord working in your life, you see Him in His glory, and you're up on the mountain peak. But, you know, yeah, it'd be good to stay there, but there's times we've got to go back down to the valley, okay? And the Lord, we've got to work, work with you down in the valley to bring you back up onto the mountain. So Peter says, look, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Listen to him. Hear ye him. Okay? Now right there, you got the Mount Transfiguration. You hear a voice. You hear God the Father. This is my beloved Son. Here, listen to him. Okay? And it's interesting, when Peter writes in the book of 2 Peter, we have a more sure word of prophecy than that which is a voice from heaven. Imagine Peter saying that. Imagine many people say, I want to just hear God's voice and speak. We have a more sure word. That's why you got to compare, oh, well, God told me this, God told me that, and all these dreams and visions. And We have a more sure word of prophecy, the written word of God. Okay, that's, a, that's something to note about that. But on one mountain, you're the voice of God the Father. Next thing you know, on the other mountain... My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they said, look, he's crying out. He's, some say he's crying out for Eli or, you know, he could save all these people. How come he ain't saving himself? He's crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
Okay, so now that the you know one one mountain he heard the voice of the father's uh, you know his recommendation his his commendation, uh, and yet on Mount Calvary the father was silent. Okay, um, now I want to look at a couple things that wrote briefly about this. Isaiah chapter fifty three. On that Mount Calvary he was stricken. He was smitten of God and afflicted. Look at look at Isaiah chapter fifty three. I just want to just look, talk a little bit about, about the crucifixion real quick on Mount Calvary. Look at Isaiah chapter 53. Verse number 7. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Um, come down to verse verse 4, up to verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now you, you come across with, with, in the book of Psalms, on that passage on the crucifixion, that prophetic passage which David writes there in Psalms chapter uh, 22. Um, Psalms 22, verse number 6. So on Mount Calvary, he was... Um, that, that saying right there, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is always like a... What, what in the world? What, what's going on there? You know, how... What was this forsaking going on here? Psalms chapter 22, okay? Psalms chapter 22, verse number 5. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man of reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see laugh. They laugh me uh, to. They laugh me to scorn. They shoot their lip. They shake their head, saying, "He trusted the Lord that He would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing He delighted in him." This is a crucifixion passage. Verse sixteen. They pierced my hands and feet. Okay, but that note right there. But I am a worm. There's always an interesting thing about the crucifixion. Okay, um, In John chapter 3, Jesus Christ likens himself being lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Okay, So what was going on? That He, he became a worm. Okay, Well, yeah, think about it. He became a worm to save a worm. That's why we sing a song, to save a, you know, uh, such a worm as I. <laughs> Okay, a worm. Okay, it's a picture. Is a is a picture of a serpent. But what's the, what's the serpent really represent in the Bible? It represents sin. So we know that uh, that the passage in in Second Corinthians or First Corinthians, uh, he who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might now what, 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 explain that he became sin. And it says right there, but I am a worm. Okay, now that's that's something that. You know, you, you can wrestle with and stuff, but somehow, some way, Jesus hanging on that cross for six hours. What six? The six is the number. What six the number of in the Bible? The number of man. That's interesting. He hung for six hours. He's hanging from mankind there on the cross. Six hours. Okay, he's a worm, liking himself under a serpent, and became sin on the cross. I mean, there's no wonder, you know, God almost like God the Father turning his back. Okay, uh, afflicted, smitten, didn't want to look down or anything. And uh, he became sin. So somehow, some way, he saved us from hell. He had to literally pay a hellfire punishment in six hours. Something to, something to suffice that, the wrath of God, hellfire for eternity. He had to take the spot of somebody burning. That's what somebody says, burning in hell. And when he gets cast in the lake of fire, what do they say? God's forsaken me. Okay? And you think in, the, in when he says Jesus Christ, his favorite verse in all the Bible is where, the, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Notice how he gives a personal, personal possession of worm. He says, their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So somehow, some way, you know, this might be a far out teaching, but I, I believe it, I think it lines up, that in the lake of fire you take upon the, the formation, they, the lost people, take upon the formation of their father, the devil. He's a great red dragon, he's a, he's a serpent. Somehow they take upon the form of the father. We get glorified, we take upon the image and get conformed to the image of His Son. Okay? 
So somehow, some way, Jesus became a worm. He said, but the Bible says, I'm a worm. And, and he, he somehow, some way, suffered and paid for a hellfire punishment on the cross. Okay? Now you look at the Old Testament, what happened? The Old Testament, they would kill a lamb. Well, there's the bloodshed. And what would they do with that lamb afterward? They'd burn it. They'd burn the lamb. Now, somehow, some way, I don't got the thing figured out or anything, but somehow, some way, Jesus Christ took our place for burning hellfire punishment while he was on the cross. Okay? Now, I always think that's something that's, that's worthy to, to note of the significance of, of Mount Calvary and, and the thing that happened on there. That's, it's amazing. But, you know, you think about how beautiful was Jesus Christ on both mountains, on, Mount, on, on the Mount of Transfiguration in His glory, yet on the Mount Calvary in His shame. Now, I'm going to look at a couple other things that may be getting a little off topic, but look at Matthew chapter 27. I want to just see some more similarities and contrasts with the first coming and the second coming. Look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, look at verse number 45. Now, I don't got, you know, the whole, that's a hard, that's hard stuff. You know, God, you know, Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and you know, he's the, he's the father, yet he's the, you know, the son and all that stuff. You know, that, that's, some, that's some tough stuff. And I just was thinking, he's also the lamb of God, but he's also a shepherd. <laughs> How could he be a lamb and a shepherd? You know what I mean? I mean, that, that, that simple one alone just, just boggles, boggles your mind. But there was a lot of stuff going on in Calvary. You know, the spirits around it. And what was, we're never going to really understand the significance of salvation. That climatic point in the universe when God came down and became sin, the plan of redemption. Um, I've, I've been doing a lot of good, getting back to good theological studies on redemption and adoption and predestination and sanctification. and the, They call them the doctrines of soteriology, which is a fancy word of the doctrines of salvation. And it's such a blessing, all the things when you, when you study what's going on in, in salvation. It's amazing. But I want to look at Matthew chapter 27, verse number 45 here. Here I am again, 26 again. Verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land. Under the ninth hour. Alright. Now, at that time, at Mount Calvary, there was darkness. Now come to the book of Joel. Look at Joel. Look at the book of Joel, chapter 2. Now this is a Bible study, so we are gonna have, we're going to have to do a lot of Bible verses. i got a lot of verses. And, you know, it's one thing we could just, I could just sit up here and quote them and just sit back. But it's good to, once you see these things, you kind of remember when I am just throwing, in, throwing them out there like that. Then you'll say, okay, yeah, I remember, remember seeing that passage. Joel chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Now on this mountain, look, okay, look what happens. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is, it is nigh at hand. This is clearly a passage before the second coming. Now look at this day. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people, strong. There has been not any, then he goes on and on with this passage about, you want to know about the, uh, our incorruptible bodies? Well, read that passage right there. It goes on and tells you. You ain't going to get hurt. A sword can stab you. You ain't going to get killed. You could run up the walls. You could, I mean, it's, you know, they, all the superhero movies, you know, that's, that's, they take it from passages like this and stuff. Uh, we're going to be f far better than Superman and Spider-Man and all that stuff, what, what the Lord got prepared for us. But notice, though, Mount Calvary, day of darkness. Mount Zion, when the second coming happens, what is it? A day of darkness. There's a similarity there, okay? Um... Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27, another thing that's interesting, should be a, uh, it's interesting because it's a similarity on two contrasting events, the day of Calvary and the day of his return, okay, they're, they're, so, they're so different from one another, yet there's similarities found in both of these, that's what's interesting, Matthew chapter um, 27, look at verse 51. 
And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The earth quaked, the rocks rent. There was an earthquake, okay? Um, look, look, Revelation chapter 17, or Revelation chapter 16, verse 18. Revelation 16, verse 18. Look at this. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. There was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. Mount Calvary, earthquake. Coming back to Mount Zion, second coming of the Lord, earthquake happens. Okay? Um, now, that's, that's something interesting with that. And also, you can write down Psalms 114, verse 7. Um, Psalms 114, verse number 7. Tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord in the presence of the God of Jacob. So the whole earth trembles. Uh, it sounds like an earthquake. At the presence of the Lord, when the Lord comes back, He shakes the earth. He shakes the mountains. Okay? So there's, there's something going on there. Now, just I don't want to get veer, veer off too much, but I, st I was thinking, well, what in the world? What are these? What's an earthquake? <laughs> so you know, this is, gets in a little side study on earthquakes. Okay, that's another picture of judgment, condemnation, and I like this one: breaking the yoke of bondage. An earthquake, breaking the yoke of bondage. Okay. Now, obviously, Exodus 19 verse 18. Write that down. Exodus 19 verse 18. What happens? I don't know. Let's read it. Exodus 19, verse 18. Exodus 19, verse 18. Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mount quaked greatly. An earthquake. When, at the giving of the law. So there's a picture of an earthquake, the giving of the law. Okay, an earthquake is that's judgment, condemnation. What does the law do to us? It judges us, it condemns us to hell. <laughs> that's what the law does to us. It gives us the knowledge of sin, and the law, it, the law destroys. Okay, now that's condemnation. You know, it points the finger at us and says, for all have sinned. The wages of sin is death. And next thing you know, it's like God quaked on that time. Next thing you know, Mount Calvary he sends another earthquake. You know, like he answers that, he answered that earthquake, the law, with it is finished upon the cross, another earthquake happens. By saying, obviously, I, I, I'm, I'm paying the judgment, I'm taking the judgment, I'm taking the condemnation, I'm, I'm going to break the yoke of bondage on this mountain from what I did on the mountain of Mount Sinai. Okay? Um, numbers, you know, I don't got to turn it I don't want to read this story, but Numbers 16 Another, another thing of earthquake is a judgment is, is Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they fell down in the pit. Earthquake, okay? Next thing you know, they fell down. God used an earthquake for judgment there. Now, I do want to read this one in Acts chapter 16. Because I think this is just cool. Acts chapter 16. So I'm like, man, Lord, these, this earthquake, they, this is, they don't sound good at all. <laughs> it's not, this is like, you know, it's fascinating to see earthquake on Mount Sinai, earthquake on Mount Calvary. And then just looking up earthquake, and I'm like, ah, oh, that... Would you look at this? An earthquake shows up in the book of Acts. Chapter 16. Verse number 20. I like verse 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. It's a blessing. He giveth me songs in the night. Uh, like, we sing, like we sing the song. And David talks about that. Give it, Lord gives me songs in the night. Praising God. Singing songs in prison. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. <laughs> So that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened. Not just some of them, but all of them. <laughs> okay, it wasn't just for his two people. I think, I think the Lord did that with Peter. He loosened Peter's shackles or something. But this is a thing on, God is out there stretched forth out his arms. He could break the bondage of, of all people. Come unto me, all ye that labor. You know, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. And it's, it's cool that immediately all the doors were open. And everyone's bands were loosed. And I look at that, that, that God can break the chains of anyone. 
the breaking of the yoke of bondage. They were in bondage. Bondage is a picture of the law. The breaking of the yoke of bondage is available to everybody. It wasn't just for, it wasn't just for Paul and Silas. Now, I think that's awesome. Now, um, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Uh, another interesting thing about his first coming, Mount Calvary. Second coming, Mount Zion. Matthew chapter 27, verse 35. This is an amazing book. I studied this stuff and it's like, <laughs> this is, just isn't no just, you know, Shakespeare or just written, some book just concocted by mankind. The things in here and the, the pictures in here, and I mean, it's like, it's truly just fascinating. It really is. Matthew chapter 27. Look at verse number 35. Okay, look at this one. Mount Calvary. Matthew 27, 35. They crucified him and parted his garments, cast in lots, that it might be fulfilled, a rolling dice. You know, who's going to get this piece of his garment? Okay, I don't know how many... Pieces they ripped it up, but they they divide that thing and was it was casting lots, rolling dice almost for his garment. But first Cal Mount Calvary, first coming, his garments were ripped in half. They were rent. Okay. Now look at this one. Look at Hebrews chapter. I think God always gets the last laugh. You know all, all the stuff. You know you, you you clearly know of the the mocking and the scoffing and the purple robe and the crown of thorns and the rod and the, or the reed they smote him over the head. All that's like, yeah, go ahead, do this to me. I'm gonna, you know, they took him like a thief in the night. He's gonna come back like a thief in the night. He's gonna come back with many crowns, and you know, come back with a, with a garment dip that's bloody because he's trampling people, and uh, come back on a horse, you know, not on a donkey. There's all kinds of these pictures and stuff. They rent, they he allowed him to divide his garments up at the first coming. Next, thing you know, Hebrews chapter one, verse twelve. Now, let's get, let's get back into verse 10. Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the hosts, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, the heavens, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. Notice how the, gar the heavens, outer space, atmosphere, this is like a garment. Like God's, like God's clothes, he can, like, it's like his garment, in a sense. Imagine, you know, I always say, imagine that, you know, we're so worked up about how we look and how, you know, uh, check out my shirt, look at my shoes and all this. Yet God's, like, he's like one was wearing the universe. And he's going to say, I'm going to take this universe, I'm going to take this thing off, I'm going to fold it up, and I'm going to make a new one. <laughs> like when God gets rid of that. And as a vesture, thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy year shall not fail. <laughs> So he's like at the at the first coming, yeah, you could fold up, you could fold up my clothes on the first coming. I'm gonna fold you up at the second coming. I'm gonna fold you up and, and, and burn you on fire, and I'll just throw in a throw in a new garment. He let him rent his garments on Mount Calvary. Yet next thing you know, second coming, you know, the, even at the at the end of the second coming, he gets ready to make a new heaven and new earth. He just tears the whole curtain off the whole entire thing. You know, he stretches forth the heavens like a curtain. He takes that thing off and. Informs a new one. Now that, that's amazing. The power and strength of God. Now in Matthew 26. Okay. Matthew chapter 26. Another interesting thing. Matthew chapter 26. Verse number 65. Matthew 26. 65. About this whole clothes. You know. The Lord's garments were rent. You remember. Who, look at Matthew chapter 26. 65. Matthew 26, 65. Another, another close was rent. Look at this. Verse 65. Then, I like verse 20, 20, 64. Thou, he said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest... Remember, remember, Phil, you asked that one question, who's, where's their high priest at right now? Well, they don't got no high priest, the Jews. But back then, they still, they were, Jesus came at a time when the, the Jews were so zealous about keeping the law, so self-righteous. The high priest, look what he did. Rent his clothes, saying, how spoken blasphemy. The high priest rent his clothes. Now, remember in the book of Leviticus, chapter, chapter 21, verse 10, 
The high priest was not to rend his clothes. You know what that meant? You're, you're giving up the priesthood. Okay? Leviticus chapter 21, verse number 10. If you want to see, if you want to see this here. Leviticus 21, 10. And he that is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated, to put on the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor rend his clothes. The high priest just rent his clothes in a complete overzealousness, you know, arrogance and pride, just rent, just threw off his clothes. Well, you, you're just, you just stripped off your priesthood. <laughs> and ain't it funny, though, that, uh, you know, kind of symbolize there the, the Aaron, the first priest, the priesthood, okay? They call the, the Bible scholars call the Aaronic priesthood. It was almost like picturing, well, that priesthood's gone and done away with. Now there's a better priesthood that's coming. That high priest just ripped his clothes off in front of the high priest that's about to make that, enact that thing. Jesus Christ, God, standing there right there. He's probably, you know, you can imagine what's going through the Lord's head. You're supposed to know the scriptures. You just rent your clothes and yet you're looking at the high, you're looking at the high priest right now. You know, he maketh intercession for us. He's our, he's our high priest. After the order, the Bible says of Melchizedek, which is a very interesting character. We could do a study on that one day. But Jesus Christ is after the Melchizedekian priesthood, not after the Aaron's priesthood. So there's some cool things with that. But, um, you know, uh, you can go on and on with just the, the thing about he ran his garment. That's a picture of our self-righteousness. We've got to take that thing off. We've got to throw that thing, get that far away from us, and we've got to be clothed in Christ's righteousness. Aren't, you know, aren't, we should be glad that God gives us a white robe, a, a white robe of righteousness, His righteousness, and we don't ever have to rent that thing off. We never got to take that thing off. Okay, he, he dresses us in His righteousness. Now, um, another thing, Matthew chapter 27. Uh, uh, we're going to have to go to Matthew 27, 51. The rocks were rent at Calvary. Okay, the rocks were, were rent at Calvary. And then later on in that chapter, verse number 54, who do you got? You got the Roman soldier saying, Truly thou art the Son of God. I would believe that that guy's heart was rent, meaning his heart was broken. The rock's rent. Next you know, the guy's heart was probably heartbroken. He believed, I, thou art the Son of God. Same thing, the second coming. Uh, the, the, in the book of Revelation, they're crying for the rocks to fall upon them, to hide themselves from the presence of the Lamb. And next you know, and it says they shall wail because of him. I'm sure there's going to be some hearts broken at the, at the second advent too. Um, let's come back to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Uh, Matthew chapter 4. Now, back to the mountains, okay? Mountains in the life of the Lord. Matthew chapter... All right, where are Matthew at? Yeah, Matthew chapter uh, 4 and 5 I want to go to. So it's interesting... Before he preached his sermon on the mount, okay, the mount, mount of Olives, before he preached a sermon on the mount, it, it, uh, right before the chapter before that in uh, Matthew chapter 4, it's like he had an appointment with somebody on another mountain, which is the devil. Okay, Matthew chapter 4 talks about him when the, Lord, when the devil tempted him with the, with the kingdoms of the earth. Uh, come to Matthew 4 verse 8. The devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world in the glory of them. Okay, and, they, and the Lord says, get out of here. And it's a, so he, in order, before he preached his most famous sermon, next thing you know, look at Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And next thing you know, Matthew 5, 6, 7 is the Olivet Discourse. Sermon on, on the Mount of Olives. Um, so that's just interesting to, to see those two mountains in the life of the Lord. Okay, one a trial and testing, and the other one he goes up and preaches one of his most well known, one of the greatest sermons of all. He had to go through the first mountain first. Um, and here's another one look at the book of Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. This is where I just want to run these references. Give me just 10, 10, 15 more minutes here. Mark chapter 6. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 46. Mark 
Mark chapter 6, verse 46. Here's another mountain in the life of the Lord. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. Now that's amazing. All right, now uh, like that little thing is maybe we should have a, a, a certain spot out in nature. Old time folks, man, they were big about that. They were big about that. I'd go to my little spot in the woods here. I'd make, you know, a little, little altar, just bow down, kneel, you know, kneel down to God, have a, have a specific spot. Jesus Christ, I don't know, he, like, he went up into a mountain to pray. Up into a mountain. And, and uh, let's look at a, a verse in um, Hebrews chapter 7. Now, not only did he depart and go up to a mountain in his earthly ministry, guess what? He's in a mountain right now, and he's praying. <laughs> he's on Mount Zion. Mount Zion, we're going to just see a couple pictures of that. Look at, look at Hebrews chapter 7 there real quick. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 25. We, we should be familiar with one of the verses in John that says, I pray not for the world, but I pray for them that are called out of the world. And then he goes on, then he goes on again, John, John chapter 17, verse 20, and says, uh, I, will pray for, I will pray for you. And the, or, I will pray for, uh, for those um, who, believe, who believed on me afterward. Not just, I'm just praying for you disciples, but once I'm gone, I'm still going to be praying for people. So th this shows Jesus Christ, his, his office of being our high priest. Remember, he's a prophet, he was a priest, he was a king, okay? That's what I love about God. He's like, he just fulfills all these amazing, amazing roles. Look at Hebrews 7, verse 25. Great verse. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Old saying, he saves from, you know, saves the... Uh, the, from the uttermost to the guttermost. It don't matter where you're from. No matter how low you are. No matter where you're from. He's, he's saving from, from all walks of life and stuff. He's also saved them from the uttermost that come unto God by Him. Seeing He ever liveth. For what? To make intercession for them. Jesus Christ intercedes on our behalf. For such a high priest became us. That's our high priest who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as other high priests. You go on and on with that. But he, Jesus Christ, where is he at doing this? Jesus Christ is interceding on our behalf. What's he in, why has he got to intercede on our behalf? Because the book of Revelation says the devil is our accuser of the brethren. He accuses us day in and day out. Uh, it's just the devil lives for it, it sounds like. He's so warped and twisted. He says, you see what they're doing? You see what so-and-so is doing? You see what they're doing? You see what they're doing? In Jesus Christ, in John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, He's our advocate. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So He's our advocate. He intercedes. And what's an advocate? An advocate is one that uh, pleads the cause of another in a court of civil law. One who pleads the cause of another before any tribunal or judicial court. He's an advocate. He intercedes while the devil accuses. Um, and, and, you know, we all know the one, but he, uh, one mediator... Between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It ain't Mary, it ain't nobody else, but he's our mediator. Okay, now I just want to show you these last couple of verses on where he's mediating uh, for us. Look at Psalms, Psalms 48. He's mediating right now on a mountain. Psalms 48, verse 2. Now, I was thinking about this. Forget about there's nothing drier and boring, more boring than plains and tumbleweeds and deserts. That stuff is so just dry to me. I, 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 like, I, I like seeing big mountains and big hills. And Lord, when he wants to build a house, he knows where to build it. He sets that thing up on a mountaintop. You say, Lord, why don't you get a beach house or something like that? I go over, you know, but he sets that thing up on a, his house is on a mountain. I mean, I was always, I was drawn to that. I like a little, little, if I had to build a dream house, it'd be up on a mountain over, overlooking a big lake, way up there, up in the cabin, up there on the big trees or something, just tucked back up there. Uh, that's just that's just cool. I, just, I think it's neat. But look at the Lord's uh, look at the, look at this one, Psalms forty-eight, verse number two. Beautiful for situation. Where this thing situated? The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Okay? 
and if you want to, I'm going to, you just write these down and study them on your own time. Isaiah 14, verse 3. And then there's another one in the book of Hebrews. Maybe we'd do well to, to see this one to establish this point. He, Hebrews 12, 22. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an, an innumerable company of angels. Okay? Now, right now, there's a city, heavenly Jerusalem. So, this is the thing. There's a physical Mount Zion on earth, but then there's a heavenly Mount Zion in heaven. And I believe that's where Jesus Christ is at right now. Remember, all those things in the Old Testament were all shadows and pictures. Build a tabernacle like this. Here's the blueprint. But then we read the book of Hebrews and you see that's all a shadow of a larger reality that's going on upstairs. Okay? So I believe the Lord Jesus Christ, He's interceding on a mountain up top. All right? In Isaiah 14, verse 3, talks about the devil wanting to ascend. I will ascend above the, the mountain of God and stuff. That's God's throne, is on a mountain. In true north is the, the direction that points directly okay, toward the geographic north pole. Uh, I didn't know this, okay? Um, north, right? God resides north, so it's like you pull that thing straight up north. There's true north. Now, magnetic north is the direction that a compass needle points to, as it's aligned with Earth's magnetic field. Uh, but here's something interesting: there, the magnetic north pole shifts and changes over time in response to uh, to changes in the Earth's magnetic core. There's a difference between the two. The difference between true north and magnetic north could be a uh, a couple hundred miles. But the thing about true north, they say, is it's fixed, and it's, it never changes. But that's where, God, that's where God resides, in heaven. That thing is fixed, it never changes. It's not moving and floating and zipping around it. There's no such thing as true north. And I think it's cool, too. The, the compass automatically, why don't it point south? Well, the, the, the hell's down south. <laughs> okay, well, why, it, points, it points north. It points directly to, to God. There's something, there's something about that, okay? Now, lastly, okay, finally, we're done. I didn't think this, I did not know this was this, uh, this exhaustive here. Sorry, but Matthew chapter, or Micah chapter 4, verse 1. Okay, Micah chapter 4, verse 1. So we've seen all those mountains in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would only make sense that He's coming back. <laughs> he's going to touch down back on a mountain. I mean, there's something about... God uses that geographical topography. He has something with that. He is that look at it. Micah 4 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow unto it. You know what that says? This is at the end, at the second coming. Well, Mount Everest is 29,000 feet tall. But it says right there, his house is going to be above the hills and all that. And now it looks like when the second coming happens, the Lord changes the topography of all the earth. I mean, I, I just believe in what it says. You say, well, I don't see it right now. Somehow, some way, he's going to make that, he's going to, uh, there's, there's verses where he says, he, you know, he makes, he makes the, the, the hills, he's going to make them flat, he's going to make them straight. He said, well, why would he do that? Because he don't want anybody higher than him when he comes back to planet Earth. You can't ascend up into a mountain and say, look, I'm in the millennium, and say, I'm higher than you, Jesus. <laughs> he can let that happen. He's going to have that one mountain you probably, I don't know, probably see it somehow, some way throughout the whole entire Earth. He's going to just have a, just a ginormous mountain situated on the Earth. Okay? Um, Ze Zechariah chapter... 8, while we're in the Minor Prophets. I mean, we'll write these down. Write them down. Write down Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3. Obadiah one seventeen. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Yeah, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow unto it. Isaiah 2.2. 2, uh, Zechariah 4.7. Look at Zechariah 4.7. Psalms 97.5. Psalms 
Psalms 99 verse 2. Psalms 103 verse 19. Uh, and that verse shows you that the, the host in the millennia, angels, hosts, and ministers. But you read all those verses, it talks about hills being exalted. It talks about the mountain of the Lord. It talks about the Lord literally making things flat, making hills flat. So hey, somehow, some way, at the second coming, He's going to just change the whole the geographical thing of, of planet Earth. And He's going to come back and set His house up on a mountain. Now that was, and this go on, on, that's a brief study on the mountains in the life of the Lord. That um, I just think it's amazing that how the Lord uses you know pieces of His creation um, to show us things, and you, you study all those mountains that we just that we covered there. There, those are big events. Those are big events that happen on, on those things. So um, pray that we just took our eyes off off everything of the world and everything on ourselves, and just uh, let the let the Lord be exalted. Um, pray that's a pray that was a blessing. So let's just bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we just want to thank you for your book, Lord. Thank you for your amazing word. Lord, I pray that you continue to open up our eyes to the things in the scriptures, Lord, that we continue to see things that we have not seen before, that you continue to teach us and lead us and guide us through the Holy Spirit. Like you said, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is going to lead us and guide us into all truth. I pray, Lord, that we uh, just receive blessings from your word day in and day out. I pray that we apply them to our hearts and meditate upon them and live them out and just allow us to continue to hide hide your word, Lord, in our heart that we don't sin against you, Lord. And just help us uh, do things with, what are pleasing in your sight. And uh, what, what a blessing, Lord. What a what an amazing thing of, of what, you went, what you went through on mountains. And uh, the particular connection that you have with, with your creation, Lord. You're in tune with it. And you control it. And you you set up everything. And this, you know, throughout history and throughout the future, you have something to do with those with those pieces of your creation. I pray that we look around, look around the world and look around all these things that you may teach us and show us things that, that we may glorify you and, and praise you and worship you, Lord, like how you, like how you want us to, and help us with that, dear God. And we love you and thank you, and uh, we just give you all praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Uh, verse memorization. How about, um, how about, uh, I want to do do one 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 about something about the mountains on on the second coming if we can. How about um, I don't know any any particular verse. Maybe I have to I have to think about it. Anything, John Paul? Hebrews seven twenty five talking about the mountains. Hebrews seven twenty five. Oh well, yeah, he he able to save them and the uttermost all of them are coming to God by him. Then we do that one. Seeing, was that which one was that? We could do that one. That's just a good verse. And it's not that it's not that bad. Once you get it down a couple of parts, it it just flows out the rest of it. Yeah, we'll do that. Hebrews seven twenty five. Um, alrighty. Thank you, God. I was kind of went over on that one, but 